Will this place get with your song? Lord, I thought. The great is a never changing God. All we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus. Every victory is found. Open wide, hearts now to yours. Every fear bow down to your love. We will see never before. Give us a great piece of never changing love.
joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us love. morning. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the gift that is today. Although it's dreary out, um, I'm just so blessed to be here in this space and the freedom to worship you, Lord, um, and you are worthy of all of our praise. Thank you that you are all we need in this life. Um, nothing else will fulfill us other than you, um, and we are so grateful, Lord. I just pray that you speak through Aaron today, that you open our hearts and our minds, um, and that we receive the message today well. And I pray, pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. put a hand to his ear and he did hear a sound rising over the snow it started in low then it started to grow sounded glad. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing. 
without any presents at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet, ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. He puzzled and puzzled till his puzzle was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. Welcome to Worship with Restore Church. If you're visiting with us, my name is Aaron. I'm the lead pastor and planter of this community. And every year, my wife and I watch the 1966 classic, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. We have very different tastes in Christmas movies. Surprise, surprise. Um, Whereas she likes to watch films like It's a Wonderful Life and The Dreaded Princess Switch. I don't know if anybody's seen that one. It's a hallmark, anyways. Vanessa Hutchins, if you like her. Um, Anyways, whereas she likes It's a Wonderful Life and kind of movies like that, I prefer Gremlins, which is a Christmas movie, and (laughs) Christmas Vacation. All right, those are my choices, Gremlins and Christmas Vacation. Uh, There there aren't a lot of Christmas movies, okay, that we agree upon, but one we always take time to enjoy together is Dr. Seuss's The Grinch. And we love it not only for its nostalgia— or the fact that it's really playful and cute, but really just because of its simplistic but also just great message. As we just watched at the climax of the story, after the Grinch has, had taken all the townspeople's decorations, all their presents, rendering most, if not all, of their holiday traditions useless, he's shocked to find that people still celebrate. With heart in heart and hand in hand, they still go out and sing with thanksgiving. It's a response that causes the Grinch to ponder his actions by, by challenging his perspective of what he thought the meaning of Christmas was. As the story goes, he puzzled and puzzed until his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something that he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas perhaps, means a little bit more. Dr. Seuss wrote The Grinch as a social commentary on his frustrations with society, with his frustration with the commercialization of Christmas. And so in in the only way, in the best way that he knew how, in a gentle but still forward way, he makes all of his listeners consider what they believe about Christmas. By saying, maybe Christmas perhaps means a little bit more, he draws his audience in softly and then hits them with some hard truth. I've watched How the Grinch Stole Christmas at least 50 times in my life, and every time that line gets me. Every time I watch it, I puzzle and puzz in contemplation of what Christmas is. Means I, I think about what Christmas is supposed to mean and if my actions actually reflect that meaning. Well, something I think we all need to keep in mind when, when trying to determine what we believe something is, we, we need to know what the word means that we're using. And so in this case, we have to know what the word Christmas means. So let's just start there, all right? Christmas. What does the word Christmas mean? Thank you, Joel. It's a word we all know. It's a word that we all use, but unfortunately one that probably most of us cannot define linguistically. The term Christmas finds its origin in a Latin phrase which is said, Christus Missa. Christus Missa. And 
Christus means Christ from the Greek or Messiah in reference to Jesus. And Missa means to go or to be sent. To go or to, to be sent. Missa is where we get our word mission from. So to say Christus Missa is ultimately referring to Jesus' mission. Therefore, when we say Mary, a word which means blessings, Merry Christmas, we are actually saying be blessed, Christ's mission has begun. That's what you're saying when you say Merry Christmas. Be blessed, Christ's mission has begun. To utter the term Christmas is to announce that Jesus has come. It's meant to be a time of celebration where we express all the things that he represents, love and goodwill towards each other. And it's all a response back to Jesus. All this to say that little bit more Dr. Seuss claimed Christmas means is in actuality a lot more if it's about Jesus. For how we see Christ affects the way that we celebrate Christmas. Meaning in order for us to uncover what we believe the meaning of Christmas is, we must also figure out what we believe about Jesus. About who we believe that he is. And like the who's down in Whoville, it will be our actions. It'll be what we choose to do or not do this holiday season that'll prove it. Which leads me to the main point of this study, and that is that after hearing in a few minutes what the scriptures say about Jesus, that we begin reevaluating what we tend to do at Christmas time. The sort of questions we need to be asking ourselves today is what do I believe about Jesus? How does that affect my view of Christmas? And do my actions reflect those beliefs? What do I believe about Jesus? How does that affect my view of Christmas? And do my actions reflect those beliefs? Today, I want us to consider what Christmas means to us. If you're tracking with me so far, give me an amen. 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 For the last few weeks, we've been in the Gospel of Luke, which presents the conception and coming of Christ from the perspective of his mother. Thus far, we've learned that a young woman named Mary had been chosen by God to bear the Messiah, the Savior of the world. She is visited by the angel Gabriel and is told this in summary. You, Mary, will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you, and the child will be called holy. He will be set apart as the Son of God. Mary is also told at the same time that her barren relative Elizabeth in her old age had also conceived and was six months pregnant. Hearing all of this, Mary responds in faith and then decides to go to Elizabeth and stay with her until she gives birth to her son. And at this point, nobody knows Mary is pregnant but Elizabeth, her husband Zechariah, and the angels in heaven. That's the only people that know. However, by this time, three, four months of pregnancy, Mary would have started showing. And so she returns home, and the first person she has to tell this news to would be her fiancé, Joseph. His reaction is not found in the Gospel of Luke, but thankfully it is in Matthew's. This is, and this is simply because, uh, church, that Each writer, Matthew and Luke, decided to write from different perspectives from the eyes of the separate parents. So whereas Luke presents the coming of Jesus through Mary, Matthew does through his father Joseph. So with that being said, um, we're going to go ahead and take a page out of Matthew's gospel in order that we may see the full picture of how Mary and Joseph saw the coming of the Messiah. With that being said, if you have a Bible with you, you can go ahead and turn to the first chapter of Matthew, um, if you would. Um, If not, there are Bibles under the seats that you can use and you can take with you if you're visiting um, and and don't have a Bible or just 
like those, you can go ahead and take one. But the words, as always, will be on the screens. Read with me, church, what Matthew documents in chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 25 this morning. Picking up in verse 18, we read this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So Matthew here summarizes like 50 verses of Luke (laughs) and says, there's this woman, Mary, who was chosen by God to bear the Messiah, and this is how his birth came about. Before she engaged in sex with her husband, she got pregnant. Now, what does your mind go to? If this isn't in Scripture, what if someone comes to you and says, what happened? Well, what do you think? Well, who's, whose daddy is it? You know, whose baby is it? Right? Now, Matthew comes out with a very powerful statement here. He says, this is how Jesus Christ came about. That is a very bold statement because he not only tells us Jesus' name, in which in Luke we find is chosen specifically because of its meaning. It means Savior. But he also adds on a word here that we haven't seen yet in the Gospels related to him, and that is Christ. So he not just calls him, this is how Jesus of Nazareth was born. This is how Jesus the Christ came about. In other words, this is how the Savior of God came to be. It's a very blunt statement. And then you read the next verse and you're like, he was born to an unwed woman. Don't worry, I'm going to explain here. Right? Born to this unwed woman and you're hearing this, you're like, okay, I wonder where this is going. And then, you know, if you're questioning that, he says, oh, yeah, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Because like, that makes sense. Right? <laughs> okay. So that's how Matthew opens it up. <laughs> He's saying the truth, but it's still difficult to kind of conceive here. Pun intended, I guess. So, <clears throat> so he says, Mary is engaged to a guy named Joseph and... She's pregnant with a child that is not his. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. She has miraculously conceived this child by the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is how Joseph found out. So in the next few verses we see, And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Matthew, we know from Matthew's gospel, he's originally writing to Jewish people. And so he doesn't give us as much detail sometimes um, in regards to some of the things he's talking about because his original audience would have understood these things. And so when we're talking about shame here, this isn't just like a shame on you, Mary. Um, This is a shame as in you're publicly presented before the elders of the community and marked as an adulteress. And you are cast out of your family. Um, And depending on the severity of the circumstance, it could lead to death. Now, one thing we have to also understand, too, is that dating, marriage, all these things look very different in this context, in this culture. Okay, So something you have to understand here is that um, there is no dating in Judaism, in ancient Judaism. Okay? Uh, you essentially, two families would come together, and it was arranged, okay? And so these families would come together, and it was arranged, and you would then, if both families agreed that these two people would come together and be married, then they would have what was known as like this engagement period. And throughout that time, it was usually at least a year, that was kind of your dating period. But there was ne- it was never date to date, it was always date to marry, if it was anything, And so in that time, the couple would be able to spend time together, get to know each other, and then 
by the end of that period, it was kind of like you had a year to kind of figure things out, and if it wasn't going to work, you could call it off. In that time also, as the husband, as the man, you would also make, have to make sure that you had yourself put up in a good position for the family that you're about to start. It was your responsibility to provide not just income, but a home. And so Joseph would have been preparing a place to start his family. And so think about it this way. What we know from Luke's gospel is that Mary's been gone for months. And Joseph has been at home, probably an extension of his own parents' property, working on a home to establish his family. And his fiancée comes home after he's been toiling and preparing and says, I'm pregnant and it's from the Holy Spirit. Joseph's like, you could at least you know, be honest with me, Right? So you have to imagine here the, the kind of response that Joseph could have given Mary. But Matthew makes it known that Joseph is a just man, right? Essentially, he knows the law. He wants to abide by the law of God, but that he's also unwilling to put her to shame, And what's interesting is in a culture where so many, where all, I should say, not so many, all the marriages are arranged, love wasn't always a necessity. And yet Joseph extends grace and mercy as he understands it and love to this young woman. Whereas he had every legal right to put her out and to shame her. Joseph is unwilling to put her to shame and is chosen to handle everything quietly. Then we read in verse 20. But as Joseph was considering these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. And then he gives the explanation for that name. For he will save his people from their sins. So the angel appears, says the exact same thing that Mary says to confirm that. And even then, right... Think about it. Like an angel appears to Joseph, right? And an angel's going to have to appear for you to believe something like this, okay? And God meets us in our weaknesses and our inability to believe sometimes. And so he shows up to Joseph. He speaks into Joseph's life. He tells him that what Mary has said is true. Still, at this point, you have to wonder what was going on in Joseph's mind. Even if he believed Mary, do you understand how people would see that from the outside? What a shame. Now Joseph has to share in Mary's shame for the rest of his life. And so he has a choice to make here. Matthew then inserts a scripture here that says, And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord spoke through the prophet, speaking of Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, one thing you'll notice about Matthew is that every Old Testament scripture that Matthew uses in his gospel doesn't just mean something about Jesus. Every single time he uses Old Testament scripture, it's about a prophecy or something that has already happened. And in this particular case, this is a prophecy spoken to King Ahaz. And God reminds Ahaz that his favor has not left him, though he has rebelled against him, 
that his line will continue and that the Messiah will still come and that a child will be born to a young woman in due time. And they will call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. What we know from the Old Testament is that this is specifically talking about King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was one of the most amazing kings in the Old Testament that restored the worship of Yahweh to the people. And God's favor once again shined upon him. So by Matthew bringing this up to his Jewish audience who understood this in that context, he is reminding them that although there was a time where they were way off, God still showed up. God still made a miracle happen. God's favor still shined upon him. He still chose to dwell with them, and he saved them. Matthew then does something interesting, and he changes the word. One word in this prophecy. What was originally meant young woman in Hebrew, he now changes to the Greek, which means virgin as we understand the word, as in without any form of sexual union. So what Matthew does to kind of summarize all this up here is he calls his readers back to a time where God did something amazing for them. And he's saying, just as he did back then, he's doing something even more incredible now. Like you thought it was awesome that he showed up and saved us back then? That he used this child to redeem Israel? Well, he's gonna use a child that's not even born to any man to redeem us and to save us. Matthew explains to us the meaning there of that name, Emmanuel. And what we find here is in this text, we have three different names for Jesus. We have Jesus, we have Christ, and we have Emmanuel. And in Hebrew, that's Yeshua, Hamashiach, Emmanuel. So that one's easy to remember. In Greek, it's Isus Christos Emmanuel. And those meanings of those words tell us exactly who Jesus is. And that is the God who saves, the God's anointed, the God who is with us. And that is what Matthew is communicating to his readers and what he would hope that we pull from this text as well. So when we say Jesus, we're saying he is our Savior. And we say Christ, we're identifying he's the Messiah, that he's the chosen one of God. And when we say Emmanuel, we are saying he is literally God in the flesh with us. Then Matthew continues and he says, when Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary to be his wife. And once again, Joseph shows us that Matthew did not write that first description in vain, that he in fact was a just man who was equally gracious. And so Joseph believes, and he takes Mary to be his wife. And then we have a very controversial scripture. It says, But Joseph knew her not until she had been given birth to a son. So this time of year, there's a lot of folklore that gets kind of wrapped around the nativity story, right? Um, And one thing I always want to try to make clear every year when I talk to these texts that we kind of take those lenses off and see it for what it really is. Make sure that doesn't get convoluted. So we have a lot of brothers and sisters in the faith, specifically those in Catholicism, that have a lot of views about Mary um, that aren't necessarily taught here. And so it's important that we study this and we understand that not everything that we hear is necessarily true, that we look to the scripture first before our traditions, okay? And so what Matthew literally writes here is that Mary, that Joseph did not know Mary until she had given birth to a son. What that means is Joseph didn't have sex with Mary until she gave birth to Jesus. Matthew is saying that for you to know without any question at all that Mary conceived and delivered the child as a virgin, that this child was born of the Holy Spirit, was miraculous, okay? 
But it also tells us that Mary was a woman who had a family and who had a husband that she had sex with. So let us not put into our heads this idea that Mary had to be, for whatever reason, a perpetual virgin. That Mary had to be a virgin her whole life. That's not what it's saying here. It's literally the opposite of that, okay? And it doesn't change the story at all. If anything, it makes Mary more relatable. It makes Mary human. It makes her faith so much greater in the fact that she literally was someone just like you and me with a mountain of a faith who God used to do incredible things. Usually this idea is taught, church, um, that Mary has to be a perpetual virgin is because she cannot be, she can't be someone of sin, is this idea. That Mary has to be absent from sin. I don't know why that has to be. If it's conceived by the Holy Spirit, then I think God's taking the sin thing. He's taking care of all that. Let us celebrate Mary, but let's not elevate her to a place where she shouldn't be. So, that is essentially what's happening here, okay? So, Joseph doesn't consummate the marriage until after Jesus is born. That's what's being communicated here. It's not Joseph never did, it's that Joseph didn't until. And so he honored Mary and her virginity and the child that she was bearing. And then we get this simple phrase that says, and Joseph called his name Jesus. And Joseph called his name Jesus. This sentence is so overlooked, and yet it is one of the most important sentences that has anything to do with this text. This final sentence isn't just a transitional line. And Joseph deciding to keep Mary as his wife, and by naming her son, he announces his adoption and acceptance of this boy. This simple phrase is an expression of his faith. It's an act that affirms his belief in Mary's immaculate conception and who the angel claimed Jesus to be. Though it was yet to be established as a holiday, this simple phrase proves Joseph was able to comprehend Christus Missa. What Christmas means. What it meant that the Christ came. He understood this boy was more than his son, but that he was the Christ, his Savior, the Anointed One, God in the flesh. And his actions reflected that truth. What made this first Christmas Christmas was Christ's coming and nothing more. Like Dr. Seuss already illustrated for us, right? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. Christmas was established in recognition and celebration of God's greatest gift to humanity outside of life itself. It's about God sending his one and only son with the purpose of redeeming and restoring the world. Christmas is about the day God lovingly, humbly, and graciously gave himself to us in the coming birth and incarnation of Jesus. Today he made it possible for us to enter into personal and intimate relationship with him. Through Jesus, we can be forgiven of our sins. That we may approach and know the creator God and our heavenly father. Christmas means Christ has come, yet for some it means nothing without ribbons and tags, packages, boxes, and bags. How ironic, church, knowing now what the word Christmas means. Is it that for most people Christ is completely absent at Christmas? 
And what's unfortunate is that this sort of behavior isn't limited to those outside of the church. That this behavior isn't limited to those who do not have faith. For those who lack the faith of Joseph, who don't have the faith of Mary or Matthew, this sort of behavior is understandable. Right? If you don't believe Jesus is the Savior, if you don't believe he's the anointed one, if you don't believe that he's God with us, then I don't expect Jesus to be incorporated in your celebrations. Although I deeply desire for everyone to believe in Christ, as Peter and Paul said, for all people to come to repentance and receive knowledge of the truth, I know that not everyone will. I know that I shouldn't worry about holding other people to a standard they don't acknowledge or presently accept. I'm not going to go around and tell people to keep Christ in Christmas who deny Christ. It doesn't really make much sense. So if you're one of those people that this next part of the message isn't for you just yet. Okay? Faith must come first. And I pray that you encounter it today if you haven't already. But let me speak to those who claim to be Christian And you say they profess Christ at Christmas. If you're one of those people, I want to say to you, do you really? Do you really? Think about your Christmas traditions and how you spend your time. Do they properly correspond with your beliefs about Christ. Do they have anything to do with Christ? If so, are they prioritized over the things that aren't? For example, is buying wrapping and giving presents like a bad thing? No, not at all. All right? There's a whole story about Magi doing that thing. Okay? In the Bible, like, it, no, we're supposed to be generous. We're supposed to be gracious. We're supposed to be giving. There's nothing wrong with that. But like we talked about last week, we have a problem when the gifts become more important than the giver or the receiver. We have a problem when tradition becomes more important than the message. Because at that point, we miss the point. What I'm saying here is that if we are those who have faith, if we are people who carry on the belief of Joseph and Mary and Matthew, our behavior needs to correspond with those beliefs. If we do believe Jesus is the Savior, if we believe he's the anointed one, if we believe he is God who is with us, what we do at Christmas time matters. Whether we like it or not, whatever we choose to do or not do announces to those around us what we believe Christmas means. Our actions, what we choose to prioritize, speaks not only to what we see as important, but what we truly think about Jesus. How we celebrate is affected by our view of Jesus and vice versa. Something that should challenge us to reevaluate our Christmas traditions and make sure that they're properly aligned with our beliefs. Think about it this way. Imagine if Joseph, right? Bear with me for a moment. This is like a what if scenario here, okay? Imagine if Joseph said, okay, Mary, I believe that this baby you're pregnant with is the Christ, Right? Which would be kind of hard to deny after the angel appears and announces all this stuff to him, okay? So the angel appears, tells Joseph, says, okay, I believe, I believe you, Mary. But then he continues in the divorce process and abandons her. Could we justify his behavior by saying, well, he said he believed her. Didn't he? Sure we could. We could justify that. It's pretty weak. But 
we can, it's a weak argument, we can justify it. But that's not how it should work, right? Like having both words and actions, would we not take account of both of them? Of course we would. We would take Joseph's words, compare them to his actions, and then conclude whether or not he was a liar or his particular belief didn't mean enough to actually make a lasting effect. And I love how I can, we can read this story and know that that's not how Joseph responded at all. How did Joseph respond? He acknowledged Mary was pregnant with the Christ. He took her to be his wife, and he adopted her son. That was his response. What he did in that moment, by naming him Jesus, what he did reflected his belief. And the same is true for everyone else. We cannot say one thing and do another. Yet far too often we do. The passage I was very convicted by this week comes from Jesus to the Pharisees. And I think it relates to us in one way or another. When Jesus said Isaiah was right when he prophesied that these people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. So they worship me in vain. They teach mere human rules. I like what Jesus said. You have a fine way. You can feel the sarcasm here. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Ouch. A lot of times I think we like to look at those people and like, oh yeah, those are terrible people, horrible people. Right? Right? But then we prioritize, like, instead of, like, making sure that, like, we read the scripture at Christmas time, we got to make sure we saw Christmas lights and went and put up the Christmas tree and brought presents and did all these things, and all those things are great. But we can't lose sight of what it's really about. Otherwise, it's all pointless. In that way, we are setting aside things of God for our own tradition, this is, this is my philosophy on tradition I share with you this morning. Tradition is only as good as the thing it points to. Tradition is only as good as the thing it points to. I, you know, that's the same thing of how we started this church and everything. It was like, we look at tradition and we're like, okay, like, does this tradition, like, properly communicate this biblical truth? It may have done it a hundred years ago, but maybe it does it now. So I guess we're not going to do that then. Like, tradition isn't sacred. Scripture is sacred. And we can't have them in conflict with one another. Tradition is only as good as the thing it points to. And it's an unfortunate fact that many of our traditions point to things less desirable than Christ. As Christians, everything we do at Christmas should direct our focus back to Christ and the things that he represents. Love and goodwill and giving and grace. So what I've been challenged by and what I want to challenge you with is that if you have a particular tradition and it distracts you from Jesus, remove it. Get rid of it. If it supersedes him, adjust your priorities. How you see Christ affects the way you celebrate. And just as it was for the who's down in Whoville and Joseph, it'll be by our actions, church. It will be by our actions. It'll be by what we choose to do or not do this holiday season that proves what we actually believe. So having heard what the scriptures say about Jesus, take some time today to begin reevaluating what you tend to do at Christmas. Ask yourselves those three questions. What do I believe about Jesus? How does that affect the view, my view of Christmas 
then do my actions reflect those beliefs? Consider, church, what Christmas means to you. Would you bow with me? Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you in this season and we thank you for your son Jesus. We thank you, God, that you not only desired to create us, but that you provided a way when we fell short to save us. We thank you, Jesus, that you didn't just provide a way to save us, but provided a way for us to have newness of life and life eternal. And this is the hope that we get to carry each and every day, not just this time of year. But we set aside time, Jesus, to recognize all the things that you have given to us, all the things that God the Father has given to us through the Son. So help us, Father, to honor that. Help us to really evaluate what we believe and if we are behaving in a way that reflects those beliefs properly. When we think about what Christmas means and we think about the fact that it literally means that Jesus has come on mission. And when we understand that that mission was for him to come to us that he may save us, Man, this time of year means so much more than anything we could give or receive. Help the things that we do, Father, the traditions, the time that we get with family and the time that we get decorating and giving gifts and all these great things, Father, that you bless us with. Help us to not lose sight of the fact that the only reason we're doing that in the first place is because you took time to give the greatest gift to us. In all these things, Jesus, we come to you and we ask that you renew our hearts and our spirits and our minds that we may move closer and become the children that you have called us to be. We thank you for this season and this time, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. All right, well, good morning. So, now that we are days away from Christmas, um, those of you that were here when I preached my sermon about um, anticipating the arrival of Jesus, you'll remember how the main point of my sermon was that we should be living with a sense of joyful anticipation, kind of like what Aaron just touched on, <laughs> in this time leading up to Christmas, but of course, all year round, because we have much reason to celebrate. We are celebrating a living, breathing Savior, amen? Amen. Not someone who we just read about in scriptures, not someone, or, yeah, not someone who we just read about in scriptures, but someone who hears our prayers, loves each one of us deeply, walks with us in times of trial, and never leaves nor forsakes us. Jesus is the one who is always there. He's the one who will never let us down, the one who knows us better than we know ourselves. We aren't celebrating someone who is just some historical figure. He wasn't just another George Washington or an Abraham Lincoln. We are celebrating the son of the living God who came down to take our sin, our shame, our guilt, everything, and bear it so that we don't have to. He's personal. He's close. He's there to embrace us even when we feel lost and discouraged. Church, can't emphasize enough that we have been given the greatest gift we could ever receive. That being a close friend who loves us despite our mistakes and imperfections, who will always be there even when we wander from him. <clears throat> I can personally attest to this, so you get a little story time with Ethan. Don't worry, it's short though. <laughs> uh, in 2019, I hit a really rocky patch, a really rocky spot in my faith. And many times I questioned if God really cared about me or loved me at all, or if everything I was doing was in vain. I was angry at God when I really had no right to be because I wasn't making my faith a priority. I was being selfish and thought that God owed me something. But despite my bad attitude and selfishness, God, through this church, brought me back to him and has used me in so many amazing ways ever since. All praise be to God. And I know that he has done amazing things in your lives as well, each and every one of you. You can all attest to something that he's done, something that he's brought you through. 
All of us have testimonies of how God has brought us through rough situations and provided for us when we were in need. That's who we're celebrating, church. That's who we are anticipating. So as you partake in communion this morning, I just want to encourage you to really reflect on who our Savior is, what he's done for you on the grand scale and the personal scale. And to just be open and honest with him. Whatever it is that's weighing on your mind this morning, whatever is heavy on your heart, just hand it over to him. He can handle it. Trust me, he can handle it. <laughs> and he understands more than we could possibly ever know. Let Jesus be your security and your peace this Christmas season. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, you are beautiful. Your name is beautiful. And we are so undeserving of such a blessed gift. Lord, even when we are at our worst, you still embrace us. You still took the cruelty of the cross for us, knowing that we may never love you back in return. Lord Jesus, I just pray that everything we have done this morning is honoring and glorifying to your name. I pray that throughout this holiday season and beyond, Lord, that we would stay focused on you, abide in you, never leave your side, Father. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for everything that you do, everything that you do for us on a daily basis and what you've done for us on the grand, in the grand scheme of eternity, Lord. We love you, we thank you, and we pray these things in Jesus' holy and perfect name. Amen. So here at Restore, we practice open communion, so it doesn't matter what your background is, what your denomination is. Um, if you profess faith in Jesus Christ, you are more than welcome to participate. And you may rise and take the elements. So, um, I'm not doing upcoming announcements. <laughs> well, it's kind of upcoming. Um, but I have a, a special one that we uh, need to announce to you all. So, um, in January, we always kind of try to review um, our leadership and who's in our leadership and our deacons and elders and pastors. Um, so, one of the ways that we do that is especially with the deacon position. Um, so... Our deacons are um, elected on an annual basis, and part of our process for accountability and um, just making sure that those people are doing what we need them to do as a church, um, we want to inform you all um, who those people are and give you an opportunity over the next month to come talk to, to us in leadership, so elders and pastors. Um, if you have any concerns or questions over why certain people are in the roles that they're in, um, if we would have any new deacons, this would be a time that we would announce it to you all right now um, in, a, in uh, preparation for officially electing them in January. Um, this year we don't have any new deacons, um, but I just wanted to let you know about who we currently have in leadership. Um, if you are unaware or if you have any questions about why they are in those roles. So this next year we'll be uh, reappointing um, Tanner as the setup deacon, Kara as the children's and youth ministry deacon, Emily as the women's ministry deacon, and Allison as the missions and outreach deacon. Um, so if you have any questions about what those roles are, please talk to me or to Aaron or to Paco. Um, if you have any concerns about how they're doing their role or um, have any comments of ways that they could improve, uh, the three of us also would like to know that. Um, so we will be having our official like um, appointment and election Sunday on, I think it's January 21st. So you have pretty much until then to come and talk to us about anything. Um, we do ask that, I mean, if you're coming to talk to us, it's kind of hard to do it anonymously. Um, but we do ask that if you have a concern that you don't just like present it anonymously to one of us, that you come and talk to us personally um, so that we have a way to resolve any kind of issues that may exist. Um, or conflicts. Um, we just want to make sure that the people that we have in leadership are doing a good job and that they are all serving you as well. 
Um, so yeah. So and then if you also have any comments on us as pastors, um, Aaron and I and Taylor, um, feel free to talk to Paco about that. He's as the elder. That's his job to do the accountability for that. Um, and then the last note, um, Taylor is on an internship contract technically, um, which will be up in I think February. Is that right? Um, so if you have any comments on how you think she's doing, if you'd like us to extend her uh, a more pastoral contract to continue working with us beyond February, please give us input on that. Um, so I know Taylor is thinking over that uh, still, if that's something she wants to do, and we're also discussing it as a leadership staff as well. So please let us know on those things. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Okay, thank you for that housekeeping note. Um, anyway, upcoming announcements other than that are as follows. Thank you. So today was your last day to turn in gifts for the Christmas for the community. So we ended with, um, I believe, 15 families signed up, 30-something kids. I don't have a final count, but I'll get them for you. Um, if you forgot to bring your gifts back, um, please let me know as soon as possible just so I can kind of like take an inventory of those things today. Um, I do want to say thank you to everyone who donated, who participated in any capacity, whether that was sponsoring a kid, a family, some combination thereof, just donating. Um, for those, actually every family, this is like a yay us, but every family that um, reached out was sponsored by you guys individually. So I just want to say like a huge thank you to all of you. Yeah, you can clap, you can clap, good job. Um, a huge thank you to all of you who, who participated in that. For those of you who donated, um, please know that your donations will go toward like grocery cards for the families. So our remaining funds um, plus some benevolence money will, will go to, to those families just to kind of help them with groceries and stuff like that over the holidays. So um, gifts due back today. If you haven't bring back your if you have not brought back your gift, please talk to me after service. Um, we will also, if you want to go to the next slide, Megan, thank you be wrapping those gifts on Wednesday, December 20th. So that's this Wednesday, 7 p.m. at Aaron and I's house here in Highland. The reason we have you bring back the gifts unwrapped is so we can wrap them strategically so each kid has about the same gifts to unwrap because you know how kids can be. Um, but also just, you know, make, take, take an inventory, make sure everybody got the right sizes, right stuff, and then also make sure that we wrap strategically for those families. Um, and then from there, we'll either do pickup or drop off, or Santa is even available, it sounds like, to deliver some gifts. So that will also be an option. So, but if you would like to come help wrap, I do think I heard that Janice and Jan might be wrapping during the day on Wednesday. So I will extend that as an option for those of you who may be like off work or more free during like the daytime hours um, that we can talk about daytime wrapping as well. But the, the day shift will be during the day. The night shift will be at 7 p.m. At, at Aaron and I's house to finish up. So if you would like to come join us for that, um, if you have extra wrapping paper or any wrapping supplies that you'd like to donate toward that, that would be helpful as well. Um, but come out and join us to wrap those gifts and then we'll get them delivered out in time for Christmas. Um, Christmas with Restore. So as always, you guys are invited to our Christmas services. Um, as Aaron said, this is just a way for us to be more intentional about providing that space and time for you to come and worship. So I know that everybody has lots of family obligations and places to be at Christmas. Um, so our Christmas Eve Eve service hopefully provides you with time outside of that like um, crunch, hustle, and bustle of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Um, so Saturday, December 23rd at 7 p.m., we will be here at the Weinheimer. That is like this Saturday. I can't believe we're this close to Christmas already. So this Saturday, oh my gosh, we'll be here at the Weinheimer. Um, we'll have a time of worship as always. Aaron will deliver, um, a, I'm going to call it like a more of a devotional through some scripture. And we will end with our traditional candlelight um, singing of Silent Night. And so we will have like a hot chocolate bar. There will be photo opportunities for your family. Um, so just come out and invite a friend to celebrate with us. Don't spend, don't spend Christmas alone this year or without the hope that Jesus provides. So Saturday, December 23rd, we will be here. And then Sunday at our normal service time, 1030 a.m., we will also be here. Um, so two different, two different services, different things at each of them. So please come out and join us and just Again, opportunities for you to make Jesus more of your celebration this year. 
And I think that's all I have for you. So Talia and Mike are over at the prayer station today. So as always, I just want to reemphasize that this isn't just something like that there has to be something like big, heavy going on in your life to use the prayer station. If something just stuck out to you during service or something is just going on that you want to pray over or even just like a praise that you want to lift up with your church family, that is what they are over there for. You can also always leave an index card and just know that the prayer team prays over those throughout the week and even like follows up on those as well. So with that being said, I hope you guys have a great week. I'll see you for Christmas on Saturday. See you guys Saturday.